Rapper YNW Melly's murder retrial was supposed to get underway soon, but there's another delay, this time related to jury selection. We're talking with YNW Melly's former lawyer, Bradford Cohen, about the tension between the prosecution and defense and what insight these latest moves give us as we get closer to a new trial. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. So a whole new group of citizens were called to the Broward County Courthouse in the Fort Lauderdale area to potentially become part of the jury for this double murder retrial of YNW Melly. A jury that would decide not only if the rapper, whose real name is Jamel Demons, is guilty of killing his two friends, but also whether Demons should be executed. Yeah, because the death penalty would be on the table if Demons is convicted. So anybody who's been following this case with us here on Sidebar and Law and Crime will know that Demons is accused of shooting Christopher Thomas, a.k.a. YNW Juvie, and Anthony Williams, a.k.a. YNW Sack Chaser, inside of an SUV back in 2018. They were part of the YNW Hip Hop Collective with Demons. They and several other young men were at a recording studio until the early morning hours the night of the murders. Thomas, Williams, Demons, and a fourth man, Cortland Henry, also known as YNW Bortland, they all got into the same car together to head toward Dem- towards Demons' home, but they never arrived. Not long after they left the studio, Henry showed up at a hospital with Williams and Thomas bleeding out in the car. Demons was not there. Henry claimed that there had been a drive-by shooting and Thomas and Williams had been shot in the head. But investigators say the evidence suggested the shooting looked like it happened from inside the car and that this was possibly staged to look like a drive-by shooting. And so both Jamel Demons and Cortland Henry were charged with double murder. The two were being tried separately. Now, Demons first went to trial over the summer this year, and it lasted for several weeks. But in the end, the jury couldn't reach a unanimous verdict on guilt. So Judge John Murphy declared a mistrial. Well, now the court is in the process of picking a new jury for Demons' second trial. And we are at the point where a potential jury pool has been whittled down and attorneys are engaging in questioning of the jurors. And there is a lot of drama happening at the moment in this voir dire or jury selection process including a major complaint from the prosecutors. To help me break this down, I'm joined right now by renowned lawyer Bradford Cohen, who has famously represented Kodak Black, Lil Wayne, even represented YNW Melly at one point in time. Bradford, good to see you again, sir. Good to see you too. Okay, so this is a bit of a complicated issue. Let me break it down for everybody, and then we're going to get into it. So the state makes this filing where they're taking issue with how a slate of jurors were excused. The defense apparently misstated the law in front of these jurors, telling the potential jurors that in order for them to find Demons guilty of murder, they would also have to show that he was in a gang because there's a gang enhancement charge in the indictment. The state said, whoa, whoa, whoa. they objected, saying that's not the law. The jury can find him guilty of murder without finding that he was in a gang. There was a back and forth with, with objections and sidebars, seemingly confusion from one of the jurors. And so the jury panel was excused. The attorneys, the judge, they discussed what to do, and it was agreed that the judge should read the jury instruction to the potential jurors. It's basically the law. Well, the defense said, hold on. If you now read that instruction to the jury after what we, the defense, just told them, we're going to lose all credibility in their eyes. And the court ended up striking the entire panel. So now the state says they're concerned that every time they raise an objection during the jury selection process, and their objection is sustained or upheld, the defense is going to move to strike the panel of jurors because they don't want to look bad. So the state wants to end this pattern. Bradford, that's the way I understand it. Um, Have you ever seen an argument like this before? I've never seen an argument like this before because in these type of cases, these murder cases, and, and when there's a high stakes case, even if it's a felony punishable by life, you make every objection you can as a defense attorney. Uh, It doesn't matter what the the ruling is, you wanna raise it because if you don't raise it, number one is you waive it, right? So on on an appeal, if you lose, you won't have that, you know, that kind of sword in your your armory. And then the other thing is, you also wanna raise it because you wanna protect your, your client's interests as best that you can. So any single issue that you can come up with as a defense attorney, you want to raise it on objection, and if the judge you know, buys your argument and then strikes a jury panel or does something else, he's taking away that possible appellate issue. So in this case, 
Do I think that the defense really wanted to strike the whole panel? I don't know if they really did or if they did that as more of a strategic move where the judge might have denied it. And then that just raises another appellate issue if he didn't strike the panel. But I think in this case, the judge is doing everything possible to really take away any kind of possible appellate issue because he sees this case that might come back in the future in case there's a conviction. I was thinking about it and I said to myself, if I was a juror and I listened to the defense and they misstated the law at the very beginning of the case, you know what? I, I, I would say, and then the law is reiterated to me the proper way, I could see the defense's argument, you know, that the jury's going to look at us like we're incompetent, like we don't know what we're talking about. We're getting the law wrong now. So I, I think that's a relatively fair argument. But you said you, you haven't seen anything like that kind of argument before where a defense attorney is concerned that in the eyes of the jury, they're going to look like they're incompetent or something. So there's two, two different ways to look at that. I've never seen the argument where if there was a misstatement of law to strike the whole jury panel. Generally, we don't talk during during jury voir dire. It's, it's not as frequent as you would think that we talk about the actual law, what you need to find, because there's a lot of objections from the state. Usually you have to stay away from um, fact specific on your case. So it's a very fine line that you walk when you say, you have to find him guilty of X, Y, Z, you have to find him this. And if you start getting into the facts of the case, that's always an objection because you can't be fact specific. You have to use a lot of analogies and things like that to see where a jury's mind is. I've certainly seen where you move to strike a whole jury panel for something that happened during that voir dire. I haven't seen it where there was a misstatement of law and that's the reason why it was uh, you were moving to strike it. So certainly it's not unusual to strike a whole jury panel for different right. reasons. I mean, there is a local attorney who's absolutely great and he's a good friend of mine who struck a whole jury panel because all of their last names started with the letter C. And they said, hmm. this is, it's impossible that this is just a random thing that every single juror is la there, she or he, their last name begins with C. It was a federal case and the judge actually struck the whole panel. He thought it was unusual as well. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand that one. What's the problem? I mean, uh, you don't even know their, you don't even know their identities, the jurors. I think that he was basically saying this wasn't a random selection of jurors. Oh, I see. And that I see. It, it is, it, there was something strange going on. He doesn't know right. what it is, but he'd rather have a jury panel that wasn't, you know, everyone's last name started with C. And the judge, you yeah. know, bought that argument. And actually, it's a pretty well renowned case. It tur turns out they're all family members. And then we found right. out after that, right? <laughs> no um, one knows. Let, let me ask you about what the judge did here. Were you surprised that the judge just, you know, got rid of the whole jury panel, basically sided with the defense? Why do you think he did that? I, I think that the judge doesn't want this to come back and appeal. So he's going over and above of what you normally see because he knows if, if, if this is a not guilty, the state can't appeal it, right? If, if there's no appeal from the state. It would only be if this is a guilty, it would be an appeal from the defense. So a lot of judges go over and above for a defendant to make sure that they eliminate all appellate, possible appellate issues. What, what do you think about the state's argument that they're concerned every time they raise an objection and maybe they make the defense look bad in a way that it's going to be grounds for a, you know, a, a slate of jurors to be just excused? Do you think that their frustrations are, you know, legitimate, justified? I, I think it's an interesting motion, but again, you can't limit what the defense can object to uh, because if you're limiting, if, you, if you're saying to the judge, hey, judge, by the way, I don't want this happening every time, he has no control over it. A defense is going to raise objections on whatever they want to raise objections on. I think it's an interesting motion. I think it's more for the, the press than it is that the judge is actually going to say, hey, you know, you guys are right. I'm not going to allow right. them to do this because that would never happen. I think it's more to show the press why it happened and kind of put some dirt on the defense and say like, oh, they didn't know the law. I, I There was another part of this um, that I thought was really interesting. And I guess you could understand why the state is frustrated because they have also said in this filing that three jurors have complained about improper conduct. Like, for example, there was a juror number three who said that people were approaching the jurors or were talking in their presence. And this juror, juror, juror number three, actually said that when she was outside the courthouse, someone came up to her to discuss her jury service on, quote, 
the rapper's case. And despite all of that, the state didn't move to strike the jury panel. And that seems pretty serious what's been happening with the jury, according to the state. And yet here, the jury panel was completely excused because of the defense was concerned that they might look bad. So if that is all true from what the state says, what do you make of it? I, I think it's, it's highly unusual. Uh, in cases where it's a high-profile case, and I've had a lot of high-profile cases, I've had a, had a lot of high-profile trials, when you have a high-profile trial, people want to approach you, just normal people. That are that are watching the case, that have interest in the case. I mean, the people that watch your show, that listen to your show. I mean, these people have a lot of interest in what's going on, and not only that, they have a lot of interest in the in the evidence. Sometimes they know the evidence better than some of the lawyers. Sometimes they know the law better than some of the lawyers. I mean, it's really the 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 era of people getting involved in these cases from when it was O.J. Simpson and everyone was kind of just watching on TV to where it is now, where everyone is kind of their own detective or their own lawyer and kind of figuring things out, I think has grown so much and so substantially that it doesn't surprise me that random people are going up to jurors and trying to get them to talk to them. Uh, but it, it is, like I said, it's improper. Uh, it's not allowed. A juror is not allowed to discuss their service. And I know there were some issues where one juror was saying, oh, Melly's mom is looking at me weird. You know, things like that, I think, are, are very minimal uh, because family members are going to be upset when their their family member is on trial. So those things will happen and people will be looking at you because you're a juror and they want to see if you give any reaction, if you smile, if you don't smile. You know, those things everyone's going to be looking at. But if there's no physical contact, if there's no talking to each other, it's very difficult other than that to say, OK, we need to strike the panel. I do find it, like I said, troubling that people are coming up to these jurors and wanting to talk to them. But, you know, that happens a lot in high profile cases. And look, you know, like you said, the, the prosecution, this is a second round for them. They, uh, they they want a conviction. They don't want another mistrial. So they're trying to, you know, make sure everything is going accordingly. Uh, but look, it's tough. At the time of this recording, we're still in the jury selection process. We'll see when they actually select the jury and then we'll see you know, hopefully during the course of the trial that we don't lose jurors because of these kinds of issues. Having right. said that, you mentioned something and I have a bonus issue for you. You mentioned detective. <laughs> so I wanted yeah. to also ask you your thoughts on this other issue. The judge in this case ordered that the lead detective, Mark Moretti, is going to be have to is going to have to be interviewed by Melly's defense team again. Usually in Florida, you know that Witnesses can only be deposed once unless the judge decides otherwise or the parties agree. So here, uh, the defense is going to ask Moretti about his credibility, not any evidence about the actual case. But it concerns whether Moretti solicited a sheriff's deputy to lie, namely telling him that he should say he was there when a search warrant was executed on Melly's mom's phone. The defense suggested this could actually be Brady material, meaning evidence that the state has to turn over that may help the defense's case. Remember, Melly's team already accused the former prosecutor, who's no longer on the case, Christine Bradley, of a Brady violation. So this idea, um, first, that he's going to have to sit and talk about, did he kind of persuade a sheriff's deputy to lie and say he was there during the execution of this uh, search warrant? That's a big allegation. I'm curious what you think Moretti's going to say. You know, I'd I always like to say that police officers always tell the truth, um, but I've had instances where they where they don't. I mean, you know, for better or for worse, police officers, doctors, lawyers, everybody is a person. Right. So everybody does things that are right, does things that are wrong, uh, you know, gets nervous, just like everybody else gets nervous. So I've had dealings with Detective Moretti before in the past. Um, not good ones. <laughs> and, you know, it, it doesn't surprise me when I heard what was going on. Uh, and I do think that they're entitled to take his deposition again, because I think that all the quagmire of who's telling the truth, who's not telling the truth. And don't forget, you know, for your audience, uh, a Brady is exculpatory evidence, evidence that may tend to say, hey, this guy didn't do it, or it may be something to uh, someone's credibility for telling the truth. That also is Brady evidence. That's why they're saying this is Brady evidence. Now, in the past, three Brady notices on Detective Moretti were filed. One saying one thing, then one correcting what the first one said, and then the last one saying, no, 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 the first one was right. 
So there's so much going on. And I just think that I'm going to be watching and listening very closely because I think that this is the tip of the iceberg for Detective Moretti mm. in terms of what he's going to say at this deposition, because I think there's going to be some complaints filed. I think that there's going to be a bigger issue that comes about. And if you recall, and this was some inside baseball, and I talked about it on your show once before, at the very beginning of this case, when I represented uh, Melly and I also re represented Bortland, uh, everyone knew I, I was representing them. Everyone knew they had attorneys and everyone knew that they were invoking their Fifth Amendment. Knowing all that, Bortland got arrested in Texas and he was get, waiting to be extradited to Florida. And detectives, including Moretti, flew over to, te to Texas to try to get him to give a statement, even knowing that he was represented by counsel. So, you know, when someone does something like that, it doesn't surprise me when mm. I hear other allegations. So I'd like to see what's going to happen. You know, listen, this is all fair game when he's on the stand. The, the state may not want to even call him. And uh, then he'll be a defense witness. They'll call him to the stand. They'll ask him what he did. And then they'll attack yeah. his credibility. Yeah. And I don't know if it'll be through, you know, a deposition, an interview. We don't know exactly what he said, what the deputy said. I, you mentioned the prosecution. They said this shouldn't even be admissible at trial. It can't be used to impeach his credibility because they say Demons didn't reach out to his mom. He didn't ask her to do anything. So this whole issue about the execution of the search warrant on the phone doesn't even matter. And I'll give you a quick response to that. What do you think? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, anything that a detective does in a case that is going to be relevant in terms of his credibility is always going to be relevant in a case. So if he's serving a warrant on Bob Smith and Bob Smith doesn't have anything to do with my case or he's tangentially has something to do with my case and he lies about something in that service of the warrant, I think would be relevant to his credibility because he served warrants in my case and he yep. served warrants on my family and he's done investigation and looked for things and said he found things. All these different things would go. I mean, like I said, I don't like to keep bringing up O.J. Simpson's case. No, no, yeah. But, you know, you know, the fact is, is that in O.J. Simpson's case, you had Mark Furman who, you know, says, I never used this certain word. Well, how would that even be relevant? You know, if you think about it, like, how would that be relevant in the case? It's relevant because he made it relevant. I've never right. used that word before. And then all of a sudden, holy cow. Yeah, well, here, let me play a tape for you. And, and F. Lee <laughs> Bailey, that, the rest is all history, right? So that I think that things that affect your credibility are always relevant in a trial and no one can sway me from that opinion. I, I agree with you. I mean, how many times and any of our followers will know when we have like experts on the stand, they you'll under cross-examination, their past review, their past reports and other cases are brought in to suggest, are they biased? I remember one expert who, who always seemed to find in every death penalty case that there was some sort of mental defect uh, in right. the in the in the defendant in the killer, like every one, and always said that, and, and they looked at his past cases and said, "Have you ever found one where you didn't find it?" And so it looked like it was a hired gun. And so it's a, it's an interesting uh, kind of debate and interesting argument. Bradford Cohen, thank you so much, sir, for coming on to talk about the latest. I'm sure this is not going to be the last time we have you on because there's going to be a lot to happen in this there case. Will. Will. All right, sir, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, everybody, that's all we have for you right now here on Sidebar. Thank you so much for joining us. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. Speak to you next time.